Good. And the rich young ruler says, and just real clearly says, I've done all these things since my youth. What more do I lack? And it's like he's right on the cusp of something. And Jesus turns and looks to him and says, sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And the sad thing is that the rich young ruler just couldn't do it. That he, he stopped. It was just like, uh, but I'll go anywhere you want me to, God, except for right there. And he steps away. And right after that, his disciples come up to him. And in verse 28, Peter says, and Peter said, See, we have left our own, our things, our home, our family and businesses. And we have followed you. And he said to them, I say to you truly, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive in return many times more in this world and in the coming age eternal life. And as I was praying, one of the things that the, I felt like the Lord very strongly wanted me to do was remind you, remind the body of Christ here that the reward for obedience has not stopped. Amen. The reward for obedience in your life is there. And this morning, I know that a lot of times being obedient to the Holy Spirit, it means stepping out and looking foolish. Being obedient to the Holy Spirit means oftentimes that your own family might go, why are you going to that church now? What's different? What's wrong with our church? What's wrong with the church that we've gone to for however many years? Because in obedience... It makes sense. And this morning, what the Spirit of the Lord wanted me to do was to bless you. So what I want you to do is I want you to rift, to rift, excuse me, I want you to lift your hands. I want you to lift your hands and I want... Lord, you said in your word that those who were obedient to you, that had left things, that had forsaken what was comfortable, Father God, that you would bless them exceedingly abundantly, that you would give them uh, even many more times what they had left. So, Father God, I speak right now to every single person that's within the sound of my voice, and I speak the blessing of heaven in their life. I command the blessing in Jesus' name. Where there has been, uh, where there has been, where there has been hurt, I thank you for healing. Where there has been rejection, I thank you for turning it around. Where there have been relationships, Lord, that have been strained, I thank you right now, even today, Lord, that you're turning them around, that you're bringing reconciliation into those lives. Lord, I thank you that it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit. In the name of Jesus. I thank you for filling them with the knowledge of your power and that you would bring forth the blessing of obedience in their lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, that was the free part. Now the rest, you got to pay, you got to buy a ticket. Uh, if you will, fill out. No, okay. <laughs> okay, so I promised that we'd get back to our, our, our pieces of paper, all right? And I've got to pull out my phone because this is a timed event, all right?
I know. Yeah, that, that's, I, I could blame this on my professors, not that they've ever done it, but you know, they're, they're teachers. You, there's things that you get to blame on teachers. My wife is going to hurt me later, too. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do, or what I want you to do, is I'm going to give you three minutes. And I want you to take your piece of paper, and I want you to describe God. Who is the God that you serve? It doesn't have to be what anybody else thinks. No one in the world has to ever read this. But what I want you to do, and those of you who are writing are starting early, and you're going to get penalized. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, what I want you to do is, who do you serve? Write it out. And go. Thank you, Jesus. I've heard a creakier floor than when it's all quiet, you know? seconds and then I'm going to go ahead. If you need to, you can go ahead and keep writing, but it, I, what, I'm, I'm not looking for a dissertation, so. And don't worry, no, we're not going to bring you up and have you share these on the mic yet. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Okay. So my question to you, and it's a rhetorical one, so I'm not going to uh, specifically ask, you know, okay, what was it that you wrote? How inspiring is that God that you serve? Looking down at what you wrote, who is that God? We all wrote down different words and we wrote down different things, but my question is how inspiring is that description that you wrote? Were the words powerful? Was it a God of awesome and wonder? What 
Was it vague? Was it passive? What kind of a story did the words that you wrote down tell about your God? Your description this morning is an indicator of what you believe. I tell you, let's just, without getting super specific, what are some of the things that uh, you wrote down? Mm -hmm. Merciful. Merciful. Okay, what else? Good. Good. Loving. Loving. What else? Fire. Okay. Forgiving. Forgiving. Assuring, absolutely. This morning, if I had to title it, which I probably usually title most of my messages, my, I would say, where is the awe in your God? You see, like I said, these descriptions that you wrote are indicators of what you believe. And it's interesting to me that they're all a little bit different. And I like that because God's a multifaceted God. Matter of fact, uh, the book of Revelations talks about uh, heaven and it gives a description and there's all of these people around the throne. And God's sitting on his throne in heaven. And every time, the, and the, there's all of these people, and they bow down. They bow down, and they come up, and they look at God, and they see something brand new that they've never seen before. And automatically it, sa it says it's so majestic, it's so glorious, that they, that they bow down immediately and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then they come up again, and then they see something entirely different. That's how big God is. And they do this for eternity. So for all of eternity, they're doing this. They bow down and they come up and they see something new. They bow down, they come up and they see something brand new. That's how big our God is. So it makes sense that nobody's description here is exactly the same. But what I want to ask you is where is the awe? When you wrote down the, that description, was it hard to kind of pin it down? In some ways, yeah. It can be difficult to say, well, this is who God is. Matter of fact, it's very often that we find that description of who we think God is, who we would say, yeah, this is God. It's a little bit off from what's in the Bible. That discrepancy, that place where we're like, where we find ourselves at odds with God, is a wonderful place to be. It's not a wonderful place to stay. But it's a wonderful place to be. And if that's where you're at this morning, I want you to know you're in good company. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3. Cha Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3. If you're there, say amen. If not, say oh me. I didn't hear any oh me, so I'm going to go ahead and go. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. And it's talking about Jesus. He is the sole expression of the glory of God 
And I'm reading out of the Amplified, so this is a little bit, uh, it's got some other fun, fun things. The light being, the outraying or the radiance of the divine. He is the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature. Holding up and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word or of, of power. When he had by offering himself accomplished our cleansing of sins and riddance of guilt. Can I get an amen? He sat down at the, at the right hand of the divine, and what's that word? What's that word that's right there? The mag, majesty. Uh, there we go. Okay. Okay, never mind. Okay, the, of the divine majesty on high. You know, it's interesting to me that of all the words that could be used to say that Jesus came up and, sit down and sat down at the right hand of God, he doesn't use God the Father. He doesn't use any other thing. But the word for God that's used is Majesty. And it seems like it to me that Jesus, after having accomplished everything that he did, healing the dead, or healing the sick, raising the dead, accomplishing our redemption, forgiving, getting our sins forgiven, literally going through hell and giving a serious beat down to the devil, having done all of that, Jesus comes up. And it's as if, even at that point, he still has this sense of awe about God the Father. He sits down at the right hand of his majesty. Of anyone that could, say, that could puff out his chest and say, you know what? That's a good day's work. Okay, it was 32, 33 and a half years, but do you get what I'm saying? If anyone could do that and just like, oh, okay, yes, I could do this. Yes, that was good. But that's not how he comes. It says he sits down at the right hand of the divine majesty. And when you look up that word majesty in Greek, it talks about the meaning is large, spacious, Splendor, magnificence, might. And so this morning, I want to ask you, how inspiring is your God? Where is the sense of awe in that description that you have? Jesus had an understanding that the, God the Father was so majestic, that he was so magnificent, that he didn't do anything else except what the Father did. He was constantly getting away and just spending time with the Lord because he was so precious. And when you read it, it's almost like there's this draw. In the book of Proverbs, there's a scripture, and it's actually talking about marriage, and it says, be satisfied with the wife of your youth. I'm paraphrasing here. And that word is the same word where it's a turning of the head. And I, rem I remembered when I first saw my wife, saw because we'd known, each, we'd known each other for a long time. I was sitting in a wedding, a friend's wedding, and I didn't know that Sam was there. And because she was in the wedding, I hadn't seen her before. I came in, sat down, minding my own business, and then the procession started. And 
I turn around and, oh, wow, there's Samantha. Oh, wow, there's Samantha. <laughs> there was something there that was like, whoa, that's not, there's something different here. Wow. And that same idea is the same heart, that same draw that our hearts have to have to Father God. Because if we don't, then it just becomes something we do. Anybody ever feel like you wake up and you do the exact same thing over and over again? You wake up, you eat breakfast, you drink your coffee, you really wake up, and then you go to school or you go to work, you get the kids ready, you eat lunch, and you do this and you do that, and then you come home, you sleep, and you do it all over again. And after a while, it just kind of becomes, boom, okay, another day, another day. If we're not careful, if we don't guard our hearts, and if we don't guard that awe that's on the inside, our relationship with God, the way that we look at God, gets exactly the same way. We've got to have that awe in our life. That sense of, wow, oh my God. Now, I, and I don't say that lightly, mainly because my parents would have killed me and then raised me back from the dead and then punished me for having said it as a kid. But as, as Christians, as believers, we were raised, or at least I was, that, oh my God, was not something you said. All throughout Scripture, it talks about taking, not taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. There, there's a sense of holiness that's reverent and that's right and that's good. But in this instance, when we look at our Father God, it's good. It's okay to say, oh my God, Lord, I love you. You are so good. Thank you. Because it's that expression of, oh my gosh, wow. So how do I get reconciled? How do I get that sense of awe back in my heart? And you know what the interesting thing, the way when I was thinking about it, it's kind of like an alignment. Recently, I had to replace one of the ball joints on my car because uh, for whatever reason, it decided it needed to go out. So sure enough, uh, instead of paying the $400 uh, for three bolts and a, and a quick little whoop, 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 um, don't ask me to spell that, it was, uh, I went out with, went over to a friend of mine's, we got it, whoop, Mike helped me and he was, it, we, we were on our, bleh, we were on our way. But it was interesting because from time to time, just like our cars, we need a spiritual alignment. And like I was saying before, when we come to that place where we look at something and we see God and we see where we are and there's a discrepancy, that is a great place to be. Now, whether or not it's beneficial to you is determined by what you do with it. Because you can see, oh wait, I need to change and then do nothing and it will not help you. And the problem will only get worse, and it will only keep, and you'll keep running into the same or worse conditions. Just like a car, every so often you have to take it in and get it aligned, right? Because the manufacturers know when you're driving down the road, what are you going to do? You're going to hit potholes. You're going to run over curbs. You're going to get on the sidewalk and mow somebody down. No, no, no sorry. I, if anybody asks, I did not do that. <laughs> Self-implication is really, really bad, I know. <laughs> but they know there's going to be things in our lives, in our driving, 
where we're going to have to get something corrected. And our spiritual lives are no different. There's going to be times where we have to look at God and we look at ourselves and it's not right. And if you add one more thing to that, the knowledge of how to do it, you know what you call that? Revelation. Revelation is simply this, seeing God, seeing ourselves, and knowing what to do to reconcile them. And the reconciliation will always be us going to God. It will never be God coming to us, just so you know. Proverbs 12.1 says, Whoever loves instruction and correction, which is what an alignment is, it's a correction, loves knowledge. But he who hates reproof is like a brute... <coughs> okay, let's not read the rest of it. No. Is like a brute beast, stupid and indiscriminating. Whoa! Okay, God, uh, can you not be so blunt? That's like really intense. Because just by a show of hands, who here likes being corrected? Okay, if there's any hands, we're going to pray for you later because there's some... Uh, uh. But I'm joking. The idea is this. Somehow in our hearts, we've got this thing that's of, that we shy away from correction. We shy away from when someone goes, you know what, here's what's going on. Because on the inside of us, it's like there's this thing. If you're, if you're going in the store and you pick up a, a, an apple and it's got some issues with it, what do you do? You put it back. If you're looking through clothes and there's a, something that's wrong with the garment, what do you do? You don't buy it, right? Somehow we've got this idea that that's how the Lord does us. And somehow we've got this idea that that's how we're supposed to treat other people. And we're convinced that that is exactly how other people are going to treat us. And it's usually from experience. But I have got good news for you today. That's not what God does. That's not who God is. God built you with correction in mind. Say that with me. God built me with correction in mind. God built me with correction in mind. Because he knows what's coming up ahead. I don't want to get ahead of myself here. It's the idea that God has not written me off. I want to shout that this morning. That this, that, so that it just kind of sticks in our hearts. God has not written you off. I don't care what you're involved in. I don't care what you're in the middle of. God has not written you off. If you're not dead, it's not hopeless. Can I get an amen? amen. Say it with me. God, God hasn't written me off. Hasn't written me off. Okay. In the same mindset, though, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that, wait a second, there's some correction in our life that has to come. We don't want to lose sight of the fact that, wait a second, there's God, here's me, uh, and we're a little off. First John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3 said, says, Beloved, we are, even here and now, God's children. It is not yet disclosed or made clear what we shall be hereafter. Excuse me. 
But we know that when he comes and is manifested, we shall resemble and be like him. For we shall see him just as he really is. And here's what I really want to get to. And everyone who has this hope resting on him, talking about the Father, cleanses or purifies himself just as our Father is pure. So as a believer, as a child of God, that desire to say, wait a second, no, Lord, I'm going to come into alignment with you, is integral. It's who we are. It's who you are. You weren't made to drive down the road and the the entire car shake. (laughs) How's the drive? That's not normal. And in our spiritual walk, a lot of times we make exceptions to where this is okay, and it's not. And have you ever ridden in one of those old jalopies? Wow, I just said jalopy in church. When was the last time you heard jalopy? Whoa, there's got to mark that one down. Oh, man. But you ever ridden in one of those cars, usually like when we were in Botswana, uh, they had Every, everything's old and you, it's just beat up. And so you get riding in one of these old trucks and just like, <laughs> and it's like by the time you're done, all of the change is out of your pocket and you're just like walking around, uh, what's going on? Yeah, I mean, you could drive for like 10 minutes in something like that. And what happens? You're tired. You're wore out. You, you're beat. You can't go very far if there's issues like that. It's just physically tiring. You're like, all I did was bounce around. Why is that so bad? Because it tires you out. Your body was not meant to withstand that type of a beating and that type of abuse. And spiritually, when we're out of alignment with God, our bodies weren't meant, our spiritual bodies, our spiritual health wasn't meant to withstand that type of abuse. So this morning, we're going to get in alignment. We're going to get some things right. Because you ever ridden in like a Mercedes or a Cadillac? And it's just like, whoa. Wow. You feel like you're just floating down the road, as I spit on everybody here. It's just... I remember uh, a pastor friend of mine. He was the pastor at my church. And... He, he had just gotten a brand new, uh, what was it, a, a Chrysler 300 with the Hemi in it. And whew, was that a nice car. And I mean, that thing would get up and go. I mean, just. And he asked me to drive it out to where he was. And I just remember getting in the car at the time because it was much better than the car that I was driving. And just being like, oh, Wow. I could get used to this. Man, that is what alignment looks like. That is what, in the spirit realm, you were meant to function as. God designed you to be at peace. God designed you to not be in strife all the time. God designed you not to be anxious. And it's those things, the, the, the things that steal our peace, that rob our joy, that cause us to be like, oh, no, I don't want that. And it's just, oh, okay, we're going to get there, I think. <laughs> so I ask again, how inspiring is your God? Does the God that you described, that you wrote down about, does it match the God of the Bible? Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. Now remember I said, if you're in that place where 
you're looking at God and saying, wait a second, there's God, here am I, and this is where I am, it's a little off. You're in good company? We're going to read about it. If you're there, say amen. If not, say oh me. Amen. I don't hear any oh me's. So, and I'm reading out of the NASB, so it's not quite as wordy. Quite. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above, him, stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And then I said, Whoa! Oh, is me because I'm sure it was probably a little bit worse than that for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts let's pause for a second see Isaiah gets revelation at that point in time God shows him heaven and all of a sudden, the first thing that happens to Isaiah is he goes, ah! <laughs> Just like that. It, it, it's, somebody said it once, it's the Hebrew equivalent of, don't go to the bathroom, don't go to the bathroom, don't go to the bathroom. <laughs> that just happened, just so you know. <laughs> but he sees God, <laughs> and all of a sudden, everything that's wrong about his life comes right to the forefront. And he goes, ah, oh, no, 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 what am I going to do? I'm a dead man. And then the next thing that happens is so awesome. Because that's exactly the way we feel. When we see God and all of a sudden things aren't right, what's the first thing that we want to do? Oh, no, no, let's go somewhere else. And we turn and it's like we want to run. But if we'll stay and we'll listen and we'll be obedient, listen to what happens. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand. Now I want to stop for a second because I need to explain. Seraphim are angels. What are angels? Angels are messengers and they are workers of the will and the word of God. Angels don't do anything except the Lord tells them, go do that. So when he says, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, it's not because somebody looked down and said, oh, poor, poor Isaiah, he's going to soil his britches. It's not because anyone took pity on him. It's because the Lord saw and said, I've seen where you're at and I've got something prepared for you. I've seen where you are. I know what's going on in your heart. I've heard the cry. Speak of the sunshine. And I have something prepared. And he says, it flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. Wow. God shows Isaiah heaven. He shows him everything that's perfect and pure and holy. And immediately Isaiah says, I'm not prepared for this. This is more than what I can handle. But because he stays right there, God says, I have prepared a way for you. It's what you didn't expect. It's what you don't think you can handle. But I've got more in store for you than what you think. I 
Isaiah is given revelation. What is revelation? It's seeing who God is, who we, where we are, and what we need to do to change those so that we're in line with God. Let's keep reading. Because right after that comes something that affects the rest of Isaiah's life. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am. Send me. You notice Isaiah didn't hear any of that before he came to that alignment. Before he saw God, he wasn't aware of it. Yeah, this is the sixth chapter of Isaiah. So there's some things that he heard God before. But Isaiah goes on for how many chapters after this? Sixty some chapters? Sixty six. The very thing that scared the mess out of Isaiah was what the Lord was using to bring him into the next season of his life. The very thing that God was using to... I don't, I don't know exactly what word to use. Motivate? That caused that pressure in his life that brought him to the point of, oh, what am I going to do? Was exactly what God was using. And he met him there. And because he was obedient... Isaiah becomes the preeminent prophet of the Old Testament. I mean, what, who is the, mo the most powerful prophet in all of the Old Testament? I mean, we could have arguments here, but Isaiah's got 66 chapters. He was the one that gets to prophesy about the coming Messiah. He gets to see Jesus coming 400 years before he gets a glimpse of the redemption that's going to happen. Because he was obedient when it didn't look like what it was like. like he, could, he, he didn't think he could do it. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I take that back, excuse me. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, before we go there. I'm sorry. You see, because if we're not cautious, it's easy for us to say, some, say well, you know that's good, but I'm not certain... That, that God was able to speak to Isaiah. Isaiah was, uh, he was a prophet. Yeah, I know God knows how to speak to Pastor Craig. He might even know how to speak to Pastor Joseph. That sounds. But Hebrews chapter 1 1. And it says, In many separate revelations, each set forth with a, set forth with a portion of the truth. This is out of the Amplified. And in different ways, God spoke of old to our forefathers in and by the prophets. And what I want to highlight is in many separate revelations. And what I want you to hear is this. God knows how to speak to you. He knows how to get your attention. I mean, for goodness sake, there's a story of Balaam where the, he, he, his donkey kicked him off and his donkey started talking to him. Amen? Look, if there's a guy that won't listen to anything but a donkey, uh, <laughs> there's hope for me. Amen? Because sometimes it feels like that. It feels like, 
I'm on the backside of wherever, and nothing is, nothing is going on. I don't understand what you're doing, God. This is uncomfortable. And God says, I know. But don't worry, it's going to get better. God knows how to speak to you. He is not short. He, the Bible says his hand is not short. And the more we come to understand that God is pursuing us, that the God of the Bible that is powerful and mighty, that spoke and the universe was created. I mean, literally, sun. There's the sun. I mean, I mean, this huge ball of gas that, that warms our entire planet, our entire way of life is completely dependent on that one thing. Shut it off tomorrow and we'll all be dead. Except maybe for cockroaches, because cockroaches evidently can survive everything. I don't know. So that, that was free. All right, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Because here's what I want you to see. When we come into alignment, this is what happens. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. A new creature or creation, depending on your translation. Old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. You know, the interesting thing about alignments is that it's a periodic thing. You have to do it every so often, which is frustrating because it's, you sometimes feel like, wait a second, I just got this done. And oftentimes, whether it's a hard time in our life, whether it's a specific circumstance that just kind of, whoa, you know, you're driving down the road, you find a pothole that's half the size of Sydney, and you go, oh, no, uh, get the alignment done again. Uh. But it can also be when the Lord gives something new into your life. The Lord brings you into a new season. The Lord brings you because of obedience and because of blessing. He says, I'm sending you forth. I've got something better for you. And it's like the Lord says, whew, okay, come on. I got some brand new tires for you. They're better than the ones you've ever known. They're snow tires. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff on the snow tires. They got little studs in them. Woo! We're going to have fun today. And you get the brand new snow tires on there, and all of a sudden, oh, it's a little bumpy. Because you got to go get it the line. Oh, wait a second. God gave me these. Yeah? He's still got things to change. But we come back to this and we say, if anyone is a new Christ, exactly. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. Why don't you say that with me? New things Yes, awesome. <laughs> I love what you guys are. Y'all are awesome. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And here's the kicker. And given us, say me, the ministry of reconciliation. So I've got news for you. That same th alignment that you're going through right now, 
that same alignment that I'm that I have the privilege of bringing you into this morning you get to go out and do that exact same thing to other people because that alignment in your life was never meant to be just for you because if it stays with you it dies that's why that we were given the ministry of reconciliation that same alignment where you get to speak into somebody else's life and say hey this is who god is and they realize wait a second that's where god is this is where i'm at ah! and sometimes that's the reaction that you get But when they see that, you're bringing revelation into someone else's life. And that person that's driving down the road, oh, why is everything so bad? Because we all know people like that. Sometimes it's people we don't even think about. Because they've got everything. It looks really good on the outside. I hope they don't look exactly like that because that was a little scary. But they look perfectly fine. And on the inside, they're going, oh, Jesus, help. And that's why what, I, what Isaiah heard came after his alignment. God spoke to him and said, who will I send for me? I see people, I see heart cries that are just broken, that are hurting. Who will I send? The same way that he heard yours. He's going to send you. Say, he's going to send me into, the, into their lives. <coughs> So this morning, what the Lord wants you to hear is this. Look up. Yes. <laughs> Figurative. But I love, I, I love that. Thank you. Look up. I want you to hear this. In the book of Habakkuk, Chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The prophet Habakkuk says this, and I want you to listen to it. Habakkuk, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you do not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and, content and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous so justice goes forth perverted. Habakkuk is looking around in his, in his life. He's looking around, and everything around him looks twisted. It looks like the righteous are the ones that are in the dumps, and the wicked are the ones that are prospering. And he's crying out to God and said, Hey, God, what's up? And now I want you to hear God's response, because this is what the Lord is saying to us this morning. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am going to do a work, or excuse me, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe it if told. Habakkuk 1, verses 1 through 5. This morning, what the Lord wants you to hear, if you hear nothing else, is look up. Because what the Lord has in store for us is so good that it's mind-blowing. 
And that's why it's so important to stand and protect and in some cases reclaim that sense of awe in our hearts. Isaiah wasn't ready before he got his alignment. He couldn't hear, he couldn't handle what the Lord had for him because he was out of alignment. And that's why alignment, that's why getting our hearts in tune with where the Lord is and saying, okay, Lord, you are amazing, you are awesome. And having that sense of awe that turns our head, that makes us go, wow, God, you're so good. Because what the Lord wants to do through us, what the Lord is doing in us right now, is bringing us to something that's so good that you wouldn't believe it if you were told. Now, I don't know about you, I can believe a lot of things. But that's the goodness of God. So this morning, what I want us to do is this. I want us to spend a little bit more time in worship. And I want us to take some time and say, okay, God, would you restore the awe? Would you restore the wonder in my heart? And you might say, well, you know what? I, I don't know that I ever had that sense of wonder. I don't know that I've ever been to that place where I was like, oh my God! But I beg to differ. If you're a child of God, if you come to that point where you said, okay, Lord, I will give you everything I have. Here's my life. Would you come into my heart? If you've made that decision, then at some point in time, you looked at God and said, there's something greater that you have that I need. Let's all bow our heads without getting. And I just want you to ask him. The Holy Spirit is here, and He's brought you here for a reason because He wanted to speak to you. He's got things He wants to love on you. Simply ask Him. Would you restore the awe in my heart? And then what I want you to do, along with us, is I want us to worship. Because nothing tells God about His awe and His wonder. see every heart here. You see every life. And in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you are speaking into hearts. Lord, that you, that you are speaking in ways never before seen. Never before understood. And this morning, I thank you for opening hearts, for restoring sense of all in our lives for restoring the things that our day-to-day -day lives have dulled. The restoring the things that the circumstances and the hard things of life have come against. And I thank you, Father God, for filling fresh, filling anew every heart, every life here name of Jesus. Would you stand with me? Here I am, I 
say, Lord, I surrender. Do what you want in my life. Restore that sense of awe and bring your heart into my life. that presence that you feel, that peace. You can take it anywhere you go. I don't care if you're in a hospital room. I don't care if you are in a prison cell. The Bible talks about how Peter, or excuse me, Paul and Silas, after having been beaten, mercilessly beaten by men who knew what they were doing, thrown into prison in the middle of the night and it says at midnight Paul and Silas get the bright idea you know what man let's worship God and they begin to worship and you know what happens the entire building is shaking if you're a situation where things look hopeless, where it doesn't make sense, things are hard, let me encourage you. Worship the Lord. It might not look like anything is going to change. It might not look like everything, it might look like everything is going to stay exactly the same, but I promise you, from the moment you start to worship, things are changing. This week, I want to encourage you. You don't have to make this big, loud, I love you, Lord, on the middle of your work site. Unless you really want to. People will look at you, and that's okay. You're glorifying God. But sometimes it's just as simple as just singing to yourself. So I shout. communicating with God, Lord, you're so good, thank you, it changes your situations, I don't know who that's for, that's for somebody today though, I want you to know that we love you, if there's anything